This is My Qualification by Tessa Bailey. Chapter 1. Taylor. To all the people who have called me cheap in the past, how do you like me now, jerks? It is only through pinching pennies and rationing resources for years that I have been able to afford this truly luxurious beach house for six whole days on a second grade teacher's salary. The bright white jewel with sparkling windows is right on the Cape Cod coast, boasts a wraparound porch and walkway straight down to a semi-private beach. My toes are already wiggling in anticipation of diggling into the sand while the New England sun bakes my skin north of translucent and most importantly of all, my baby brother gets a change of scenery to recover from his heartbreak. Wheeling my suitcase in one hand, holding the house key poised for immediate lock insertion in the other, I look back over my shoulder to find life returning to Jude's boyishly handsome features. Damn, Taylor, I guess ripping your napkins in half paid off. No one needs a whole napkin if they can eat carefully enough. I sing back cheerfully. No arguments here, not when you've scored us with this view. Jude adjusts the surfboard under his arm. So, someone owns this place and rents it out? I can't imagine anyone not wanting to live here year-round. You would be surprised. Most of the homes on this street are rentals. I nod at a nearly identical home across the narrow lane with shingle sidings and purple hydrangeas bursting in all directions in the front yard. I look into that one too. But there was no clawfoot bathtub. Jesus, he draws out the sarcasm. We'd practically be camping. I stick my tongue out at him over my shoulder, stop in front of the entrance and slip the key into the lock, turning it with a heightening sense of excitement. I just want everything to be perfect. You deserve a nice vacation, Jude. What about you, T? asks my brother. But I'm already pushing inside and oh, oh yes. It's everything the owner promised online and more. Panoramic windows overlooking the turbulent Atlantic, a hillside of seagrass and wildflowers tumbling down to that sapphire ocean, high beam ceilings, a fireplace that turns on at the push of a button, big inviting couches and tasteful nautical themed decor. There is even a hint of something in the air, a scent I can't quite put my finger on, but it's got a kick. And best of all, the ocean plays a gentle soundtrack that can be heard anywhere in the house. You didn't answer me, Joe draws, leaning his board against the wall and poking me in the side. Don't you think you deserve a nice vacation too? A year of Zoom classes with children who were secretly playing Minecraft off camera? Then straight into another year of bringing a new class up to speed, basically covering two years worth of material? You deserve a trip around the world at this point. I suppose I do deserve this vacation. I'm going to enjoy myself, but I'm much more comfortable focusing on Jude's good time. He's my baby brother after all, and it's my job to take care of him. It's been that way since we were children. I forgot to ask if you've heard from mom or dad at all recently. It's a question I always hold my breath after asking. They were in Bolivia the last time I spoke with them. Still there, I think. Potential riots on the horizon and they're clearing the National Museum, just in case. Our parents always had the weirdest job at Career Day. Officially, they're archaeologists, but that title is a lot more boring than the actual duties, which include being contracted by foreign governments to protect and preserve art during times of civil unrest, while priceless treasures could potentially be destroyed. Inevitably, at career day, a child in the front row would say, you're kind of like Indiana Jones, and my parents, who were prepared for this, would below. Snakes! Why does it always have to be snakes? Perfectly synchronized. They are such fascinating people. I just don't know them very well. But they gave me greatest treasures of my life, and he's currently sprawling out on the closest piece of furniture, as he is wont to do, effortlessly belonging everywhere he goes in the flannel and Brinkenstocks. You can take the biggest room, all right, he yawns, dragging sun-tained fingers through scruffy dark blonde hair. When I start to argue, he points at his mouth and makes a zipping motion, indicating that I should shut up. It's not up for debate. I couldn't even afford to chip on in this place. You get the master. But after everything with Bartholomew, a shadow casts on his face. I'm fine. You can't worry about me that much. Says who? I sniff, wheeling my suitcase towards the kitchen. Seriously, what is that aroma? It's kind of like a big meal was prepared in the kitchen very recently 
and the garlic and spices are still lingering in the air. You just take your nap. I laugh under my breath when his snore cuts me off. My brother could fall asleep on the wing of a 747 with a flight in progress. Meanwhile, I have to perform a very specific nighttime ritual of stretching and exfoliating and precise pillow placement to wrangle a measly four hours. Maybe the waves will lull me to sleep while I'm here though. One can hope. With a hopeful exhale and squaring of my shoulders, I stow the handle of my roller luggage and pick it up against my chest. My alteliterian teaching flats carrying me up the stairs. The Clawford bathtub has been calling my name since I saw it online, but it in the background of one of the pictures. Not featured as it should have been. There is only a shower stall in my apartment back in Hartford, Connecticut, and I dream of baths. Several of the accounts I follow on Instagram are dedicated to luxury bath time rituals, including people who eat full meals while submerged in hot water and bubbles, spaghetti and meatballs right there among the suds. I'm not sure I'll ever take the bath time quite so far, but I respect their enthusiasm. The master suite is big and inviting, decorated once again in nautical theme, the palette consisting of creams and whites and light blues, though it was sunny when we arrived, clouds are currently passing over the sun, darkening the walls. Quiet. It's so quiet. The bed invites me to come take a nap, but nothing short of a hurricane warning is going to keep me from taking the bath I've been envisioning for weeks. When I walk into the bathroom, I don't even bother trying to hold in my squeal when I spot the tub at the far end, silhouetted by a floor-to-ceiling picture window. Leaving my suitcase just outside the door, I kick off my shoes, my spine tingling with excitement, although that pungent smell is upstairs too. Isn't that odd? Maybe the previous renter was the type to eat their meals in the bathtub and they accidentally rented rot? Hmm. The rest of the house is immaculate. That doesn't really track. There must be a dead mouse or rat in the wall somewhere, but I'm not going to let that stymie our good time. I'll simply call the owner and ask him to send over pest control. A minor blip on the overall radar of the vacation will be taken care of in no time. Jude won't even have to wake up from his nap. The clawfoot tub beacons me from the far side of the bathroom and I can already hear the white noise of the water running. Can already see the steam curling and fogging up the window pane. Maybe I can get one tiny little bath before I call the owner about the smell. Experimentally, I close the bathroom door and stink is significantly dulled. Bath time it is. I do a little shimmy on my way to the tub, flipping on the hot water faucet with a flourish and sign, looking out over the sparsely populated beach. Most likely everyone is home, recovering from the 4th of July, which was only yesterday. The rental fees was significantly cheaper this side of the 4th. My widely popular brother had several barbecues to attend over the long weekend. Anyway, so arriving on the 5th, a Tuesday, worked out for both of us. With the tub halfway to full, I returned to the bedroom briefly to take off my clothes and fold them neatly on the bed to be placed in the travel hamper as soon as I officially unpack. Holding my breath against the smell, I start to return to the bathroom when something important occurs to me. I found this rental on stayin.com at the very top of their rental checklist was this. Always make sure the fire and CO2 alarms are working upon arrival. Better do it before I forget. I murmur, glancing up at the ceiling, though the detectors are probably out there in the hallway. Two little holes. There are two little holes drilled into the crown molding. No. No. No way. I have to be imagining that. Goosebumps prickle down my naked limbs and I fold my arms around my breasts. The pulse in my temple starts to pound and I shiver. A conditioned response to being surprised, that's all. I'm sure it's just where the nails were hammered into the molding. Surely those aren't peepholes. Damn it, I knew I was getting in too deep with my true crime podcast. Now everything is a life or death situation. The beginning of a grisky hack job that law enforcement will inevitably claim is the worst they've seen in the 20th your career. That's not what is happening here. This is not a new episode of Etched in Bone. Dateline's Keith Morrison is not narrating this little panic attack. This is just my simple boring life. I'm just a girl on a quest for a path. Turning in a circle, I search the perimeter of the ceiling for any other holes of that size and come up empty. Damn it. Of course those were two holes on the side of the room that are faced to the center of the house. There could be an attic or a closet on the other side. Gross. Please let your imagination be working over time. 
Still, I'll never be able to relax now, so I quickly shut off the bath with no sense of regret and wrap a towel around my naked body, returning to the space beneath the holes, regarding them warily as if they're going to jump down and bite me. I've heard of this kind of thing, obviously. Voyeurism. Everyone has, but it's not the kind of problem one would expect to have at a beachfront property that costs a month's worth of paychecks. Those cannot be peepholes, no way, just a defect in the wood. As soon as I confirm that, I'm neck deep in hot water and this perfect vacation is off to a flawless start. Before I can allow myself to get scared, I venture into the hallway outside the bedroom and open the adjacent closet, releasing a pent up breath when there is no peeper inside. Although, there are no holes either. Not in the immediate closet, but there is removable panel on the shared wall. A crawl space? Speaking of crawling, that is what my skin is doing. Was the house so dark and quiet when we arrived? I can't even hear Jude snoring anymore. Just the distant drip of bathtub faucet. Drip, drip. And the sound of my breath now as it accelerates. Jude, I call, my voice sounding like a curtain dripping in total silence. Jude, I call louder. Several seconds pass, no sound. And then footsteps are coming up the stairs. Why is my mouth dry? It's only my brother. But when my back hits the wall, I realize I'm cowering there, my fight or flight instinct preparing me to dash for the bedroom and lock the door. If what? If someone other than my brother is coming up the stairs, what kind of a horror movie do I think I'm living in? Calm down. My parents infiltrate riots to save artwork in the name of preserving history. Obviously, their bravery is not a hereditary trait. Two little holes in the crown molding have made my heart jackhammering. Even more so than the first day of in-person class with a mob of second graders who had been cooped up for a year with limited physical activity. Could you be any more pitiful, Taylor? If I need proof that at 26, my life is too safe and predictable, here it is. One wrench in the engine and my routine-oriented self is ready to self-destruct. I slump against the wall when Jude's yawning face comes into view. What's up? Swallowing my nerves, I gesture vaguely at the closet. So this is probably me being crazy, but are there two holes near the ceiling in the bedroom? And I think they correspond to that crawl space up there. Jude is awake now. Like peep holes? Yeah, I wins. Or I could just be imagining things. Better to be safe, he murmurs, passing me into the bedroom. Hand on hips, he observes the holes for a long moment before meeting my eyes. His expression is suspicious, not teasing like I was hoping for. What the fuck? Okay, I let out a slightly unsteady breath. You're not laughing and pointing out some flaw in construction like I was hoping you would. No, but let's take stock, D. If those are peepholes, there's no one peeping now. He returns to the hallway to stand beside me. Both of us stare at the crawl space. But neither one of us is going to relax until we're positive, right? I groan. Visions of my bath dissipating like wipes of smoke. Should we call the police? He reconsiders my total irrational question, really considers it stroking the scruff of his chin. This is one of the reasons I love Jude so much. With siblings, so naturally we've had our share of bickering fights and outright shouting matches over the year. But he's on my team. It's a given. He doesn't accuse me of being crazy. He takes me seriously. The things that are important to me are of equal importance to him, and I will always do everything I can to make his life easier the way he's done for me in the near constant absence of our parents. I think I'll just pop off that panel and have a look. Jude says finally. I don't like it. Jude might be well over six feet tall right now, but a grown 23 year old man, but he'll always be my little brother. And the thought of him confronting a possible peeping Tom on my watch makes me nauseous. At the very least, we should have a weapon handy. Need I remind you that I took jujitsu for six months? Need I remind you that you only hung in there that long because you were waiting for the instructor to break up with his boyfriend? They were clearly on the rocks. I'm sure your dimples helped speed things along. You're right. He gives me an intentionally creepy smile. They are the true weapon. I shake my head at him, but thankfully the shivers are subsiding. All right, he claps his hands together. Let's take a quick look and pray we don't find a jar of fingernails or some shit. Or a GoPro. I mutter, bracing myself against the wall, hands covering my face. I watch through the cracks of my fingers as Jude slides into the closet, reaches up and eases aside the panels to reveal a small space. Very small. Immediately, however, daylight streams in through the two holes and it is impossible to ignore the fact 
that they were exact width of an average set of eyes and they go straight through the bedroom. Peepholes. 100%. Oh god. Yuck. Is there anything or anyone up there? Jude grasps the edge of the crawl space and does a quick pull up. Nope. Nothing. He drops down. A person would have been tiny to fit up here. Or really flexible. So unless my powers of deduction fail me, the peeper is a gymnast. Or a small woman. We trade a skeptical look. Yeah, that doesn't really fit the peeper profile, does it? I pull up my towel tighter beneath my armpits. So what do we do? Send me the contact info of the owner. I'll give him a call. Oh no, I'll do it. I don't want this to disrupt our vacation time. Go take your nap. He's already on his way back to the stairs. Send me the info to you. For some reason, I still don't want to be alone with the peepholes, so I scurry along after my brother in my towel. Fine. I chew my lip. I think I'll check the laundry room for a stepping stool and some tape to cover up the holes. He tosses a wink back at me. In case the peeper is a ghost? Oh, sure. It's funny now. But as soon as it gets dark, a peeper ghost will become a totally realistic possibility. Take the other room if you want. I don't mind being spied on by Casper. I'm laughing as we reach the bottom of the stairs, both of us hooking right into the kitchen where the drawer of the laundry room is located. You'd probably enjoy it, I say. Have you been reading my diary again? By the time I pull open the door of the laundry area, I'm having such a good time with my brother that I don't believe what I'm seeing at first. It has to be a joke. Or a television screen playing a grisly reenactment from a Netflix true crime documentary. There cannot be a large dead man stuffed in between the washer and dryer. Face purple with bruises, eyes glassy and unseen. And there in the center of his forehead is a neat black edged bullet hole. It simply cannot be happening. But the bile that spears up my throat is real. So is the eyes that hardens me. Head to toe. A scream freezing in my throat. No, 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 no. Taylor, Jude approaches, sounding concern. On instinct, I try to push him away. My little brother shouldn't see things like this. I have to spare him from this. My hands prove ineffective. Unfortunately, before I can summon enough strength, enough wherewithal to prevent Jude from looking into the laundry room, he's already beside me. And then he's dragging me backwards several feet, yelling, what the fuck? An eerie buzzing silence descends. The image doesn't go away. He's still there, still dead. There is something vaguely familiar about the man, but I'm shaking and trying not to vomit and that is garnering all of my concentration. Oh God, oh God, what is happening here? This isn't a joke. Okay, I whisper. Now I think we should call the police. Chapter two, I'm wrapped in a blanket, awash in the glow of the flashing blue lights. This is not supposed to happen in real life. I'm trapped in an episode of Etched in Bone. I'm the innocent bystander who stumbled upon the macabre scene. Of course, the years of therapy I will need to recover won't even be mentioned in the show notes. The pithy host won't pronounce my name correctly, but me? I doubt I'll ever forget the sight of that murdered man as long as I live. Unless, maybe this is a very vivid nightmare. Nope. There is definitely a huge black bag being wheeled out of my house by medical examiners out of the crime scene while Jude and I watch it all happen with our jaws in our laps. We are trying to focus on what the police officer is saying from his seated position on the coffee table in front of us but we have now given him our statements three times each, not a single detail has changed. And now that the adrenaline of discovering a murder victim is beginning to wear off, I'm getting a strong case of get the hell out of here. It has to be a murder, right? I say, mostly to myself. He couldn't have shot himself straight to the forehead like that. No, admits the officer. A man in his early 40s named Officer Wright who bears a striking resemblance to Jamie Foxx. So much so that I did a double take when he walked through the front door. It's next to impossible. So the killer, they're still out there? Jude says, maybe even next door? The officer sighs. Well, yeah, another possibility. And that's going to make our job pretty tough. Damn near all these places become rentals in the summertime, meaning it's not local in residence. Could be anyone from anywhere, a visitor of a visitor of a visitor. These rental sites like Stain.com have become a goddamn nuisance. No offense. None taken, I say automatically, watching the final stretch of the body bag disappear into the front door. That's when it hits me. The man looked so familiar. That is the owner of the house, Oscar. I remember now. I fumble for my phone. The picture is on the listing. The officer rests his hand on mine, stalling my actions. We already know he is the owner. Matter of fact, we know all too well that he lived here. A different police officer passes by and clears his throat loudly. Officer Wright's mouth snaps shut. 
As soon as the other man has walked out of the house, Jude and I lean forward almost simultaneously. What did you mean by that? Jude asks. You know all too well that he lives here. Wright checks over his shoulder, sighs, pretends to be writing something in his notebook. Someone at stain.com should have gotten in contact with you. We communicated at length with them over the whole situation. They should have never let you come here. Wait, slow down. Jude drags a hand down his face, visibly regrouping. What situation are you referring to? We were called here a few nights ago for a domestic disturbance. The officer's voice is low enough that we have to lean even closer to make out his words. At this point, I can basically count the hairs on his goatee. One of the renters down the block phoned it in. Reported shouting, loud crashes. He taps his pen against his thigh, checks side to side again. Turns out a bunch of girls were renting this place and they came across the peepholes upstairs. Oh my god! I slap a palm against my forehead. I forgot about the peepholes. You were pretty distracted. Jude says, patting me on the back but keeping his attention on the officer. So we weren't first to discover the little bonus amenity? Wright shook his head. The girl who found them called her father, big, long-haul trucker type. Well, he showed up pissed as hell, understandably, but instead of calling the police, he had his daughter call the owner and bring him over. The father got a few punches in before we arrived to break it up. The girls agreed not to press any charges as long as they got a refund and no assault charges were filed against her father. But Stain.com was contacted about this by Barnstable PD. You should have been informed. Yes, we should have. Mentally, I'm already writing an, a stern email to stain.com. It might include a few choice words like emotional trauma and legal counsel and account credit. Did they actually catch Oscar looking through the holes? No. Right choose on the next part before spitting it out. But there was a camera set up on a tripod. Without looking at my brother, I know our faces are identical with disgust. Shaking off the chill, it gives me to know that a man had been spying on women illegally in this house and I was about to embark on six days here, I go back to finding an explanation. I guess the altercation with the angry dad explained bruises on Oscar's face. But the father of those girls didn't murder him, right? Oscar was alive and the whole situation was resolved. Right, shrugs. My lieutenant thinks that the father was still revved up after all was said and done. Come back to finish up the job. Homeowner gets his ass kicked by one suspect, then winds up getting killed by another? In the same damn week? Nah, we don't believe in coincidences. Not that big. Yeah, except something about the scenario is bothering me though. Not quite sitting right. And I really, really should stop trying to fit everything together neatly when nothing about this is neat or tidy. But I've always had a hard time leaving puzzles unfinished. However, usually my puzzles come with 5,000 pieces, not peepholes and bullet wounds. Still, my inquisitive nature is the only thing that I inherited from my parents. I definitely wasn't born with an ounce of their courage. A fact that they've lamented several times over the years, patting my head and giving me forced smiles. That's a little school teacher, always playing it safe. Jude has been surfing in Indonesia, skydiving in Montana, he works in an animal sanctuary, mostly with pandas, but sometimes he actually feeds lions. There's a video of him online actually cuddling one of the big cats, like rolling around in the grass with the giant creature while he laughs and scrubs the lion's mane. I almost dropped dead when someone emailed it to me. Of course, no one even thought about consulting Jude's big sister about the whole dangerous business, but I'm not salty about it anymore, mostly. So, okay, courage is not something I have in large supply. This vocation is one of the most adventurous things I've done in a while. I actually had to chew on a throw pillow when I clicked book on this reservation. But something happened inside of me when I walked into the laundry room and saw poor Oscar staring blankly into space. Or rather, nothing happened. The world didn't end, despite the terrifying circumstances. I stayed standing, right there on my own two feet. Maybe now I'm curious about what else I can do. Maybe I'm curious if I can help. Be brave like my parents and Jude, or the hosts of Itched and Bone, who infiltrate the scenes of the small town murders they investigate, asking the tough questions. Can I be brave like that? Am I braver than I've always thought? Jury is still out, but I do have a super strength that involves overthinking everything to death, which is what I am doing right now, knowing on the facts and finding plot holes. Perhaps this is not my job. Maybe I should focus on finding us another place to stay, but I can't help but feel personally involved, having been the one to discover Oscar's body. I found him. And while it sounds crazy, I feel a certain responsibility towards holding the murderer accountable and completing the puzzle. I'm not sure I can move on from the whole ordeal until the lid has been properly sealed on the facts. 
Officer Wright, a wail of grief rattles the window panes, followed by a shout of denial. No, not my brother. Oscar? Oscar? Jude and I blink at each other and whip around to face the front open door. At the open doors of the ambulance, a woman collapses into the arms of an emergency medical technician, her head back in a howl of anguish. A voice cracks over the radio attached to Wright's shoulder. Yeah, we've got the Wick sister here. Can someone send down the social worker? Oh no. The tip of my nose begins to burn and I reach for Jude's arm without thinking, squeezing. That poor woman. She just lost her brother. Can you imagine what she's feeling? The officer in front of us grunts. She's probably going to feel a lot different when she finds out what he's been doing. Confused, maybe, but still sad. Jude mutters, falling back against the cushions, visibly exhausted. Poor baby never got to finish his nap. I need to find him a safe bed for the night. Yes, I agree with my brother. To write, I ask, are you positive Oscar is the peeper though? The holes? I'm cut off once again when the weeping woman stumbles into the house. Using the walls to support herself, she takes one step into the living room, followed by two more, then falls boneless to the couch on our left. My eyes are walled up now and on the verge of spelling, just imagining her grief. If I lost my brother, I wouldn't know up from down. I'm so sorry for your terrible loss. Her attention zips to mine and I don't want to. But I notice that her eyes are dry. Everyone experiences grief differently. Paging Amanda Knox. I'm not judging. I just make an entirely casual, non-judgmental mental notation. A cactus could thrive on those arid cheeks. Do you mind me telling your name, ma'am? Right prompts her. Lisa. Lisa Stanley. She pins me and Jude with a look. Who are you? I'm Taylor Bassey. This is my brother, Jude. We were staying here, or supposed to be staying here, rather. But we found Oscar right after we arrived. Oh, well, I'm sorry my dead brother ruined your vacation, she snaps. Before I can rush to reassure her that we are not complaining, her face crumples. I'm sorry, I just... I don't mean to be unkind. I just can't believe this is happening. They say he was shot. Who would shoot my brother? He doesn't have a mean bone in his body. No enemies. No one says anything. But Wright obviously missed poker face training at the academy because he looks ready to explode. What? Asks Lisa, spine straightening. What is it? The world's most uncomfortable conversation ensues while Wright tells Lisa about the confrontation with the renter's father over the peepholes and camera. While he's finished giving the details, Lisa stares off into space. Why wouldn't he tell me that he had gotten beaten up? Probably embarrassed, considering the circumstances. With a sigh, Wright hands us his card and stands up. Let me know if you think of anything else. If you're looking for a place to hang your hat for the night, there's a double tree in Hyannis. Pool is decent. Thanks, Jude says, taking the card. As soon as Wright has left the front door, my brother stands. I'll go call the double tree. No need to do that, Lisa interjects quickly, seeming to crack herself off guard. When we only stare at her blankly, she digs in her purse and takes out a large assortment of keys crammed together into a ring. My brother owns three other rentals on this block. I schedule maintenance for him, inspect the premises before new renters arrive, etc. I was getting late here to double check this place or I would have found him. She lets out a long exhale. He is was pretty hands-off with the whole business, a normal guy, used to deliver mail for a living before he got into real estate. God love him, my brother was lazy. He delegated. That's why she shakes her head a little. It just doesn't make sense. Oscar wouldn't spy on people. No, it doesn't make sense. I blurt out before I can stop myself. Taylor, Jude says out of the corner of his mouth, pump the brakes. It's her brother, I whisper back. I would want to know everything. I love you, but please don't get involved in a murder investigation. I'm not getting involved. I'm just passing on some specifics. Textbook involvement. Lisa drops down in front of us on the couch table, occupying the spot where Wright once sat. Elbows on her knees, she leans forward and up close. I can see the physical similarities she shares with Oscar, both in their 50s. Slightly hooked noses, big foreheads, graying hair. But Lisa is more on the petite side, while her brother was... Too big. Oscar was too big to fit in that crawl space. Lisa's antenna go up. The crawl space where you found the peepholes? That's right. I ignore Jude's groan. No way he could have gotten up there. He would have used a lather tea. My brother joins the conversation with nothing short of reluctance, adding, hypothetically of course, for Lisa's benefit. It would have been pretty easy to drill those holes from either side, and he didn't need to get inside the crawl space. All he had to do was slide in the camera. Yes, if he never intended to look through the holes. For a single fleeting moment, I feel like SVU's Olivia Benson. All I need is the overcoat, fathomless brown eyes, and Stabler by my side looking broody and fine. Why did he drill two of them? 
I split a look between my brother and Lisa. Those holes were drilled for the express purpose of a person looking through them. If Oscar, hypothetically, only wanted to film his guests, he would have needed a single hole, not two. Jude frowns down at his hands for a moment. You're right. At the very least, it's odd. You're saying whoever drilled the holes is small enough to fit in the crawl space. Lisa says slowly, beginning to nod. A woman, perhaps? Don't think about the fact that she hasn't cried. Not a drop. Maybe. Jude is beginning to get a weird vibe. I can tell because he's doing that thing where he can't stop arranging and rearranging the shaggiest section of hair on the top of his head. We should call Double Tree Taylor. I'm sure Miss Stanley has a lot of calls to make. The police are already so positive it's the father of last tenant. Lisa tosses a glance out of the window where officers are standing in a huddle at the end of the driveway. And let's be honest, there's no way they're going to go above and beyond for someone they believe is a pervert, right? Cogs are turning behind her eyes. Maybe I should look into a private investigator. My boyfriend is currently deployed, but he grew up with a guy in Boston, some former detective turned bounty hunter. Someone who could give these locals a run for their money and maybe clear my brother's name in the process. See? We all grieve in our own ways. I cry. Lisa avenges her loved ones. Moral of the story, everyone is braver than me. I don't think a private investigator would hurt, I say, finally taking pity on Jude and rising from the couch, letting the blanket slide off my shoulders. Once again, Lisa, I'm so sorry for your loss. I hold out my hand for a shake. I wish we had met under better circumstances. She pulls me into a hug. You've given me hope, Taylor. Thank you. I don't want him to be remembered as some sleazebag. I'm going to find out what really happened. Something cold and metallic is pressed on my hand and I look down to find a set of keys. It's only down the block, number 62. I insist. I try to hand the keys back. Oh, we really couldn't. Are you sure? She waggles her eyebrows. It has a clawfoot bathtub. Am I wearing a sign or something? Oh, I breathe. Really? Jude hangs his head for a moment, then heads reluctantly for the suitcases. Number 62, you say? On the way out of the house, I stop short at the console table just inside the door. While I was reading through reviews of the house, I saw a picture of the guest book. Obviously, this makes me a total dog. But I was looking forward to writing our own messages on top of the page for future guests to read. I was going to draw a squid in the margins. Sliding open the drawer on the table, I spy the wide leather book with gold embossed lettering. Guest experiences. I'm not sure what possesses me to take it. To quickly slide it in my purse and cover up with my hands, sanitizing wipes and sunglass case while Jude rapidly shakes his head at me. Maybe I've surprised myself by being so coherent tonight after discovering a body and I want to know what else I can do. If I can have what it takes to solve a mystery and locate the metal, I've always been missing. Or maybe I'm dubious of the police's motivation to inspect this murder beyond their original theory. And let's face it, Lisa's lack of emotion won't stop poking at my sixth sense. I didn't know I had a sixth sense. Whatever the cause of my impromptu evidence heist, I'll return the book tomorrow after I have a little peek. No big deal, right? Chapter 3, Miles. I climb off my bike and pop an antacid. Well, isn't Cape Cod just cheerful as hell on this sunny Thursday afternoon? Little signs hanging from every door proclaiming that life is a beach. Beach life. Life is better at the beach. Seize day. How anyone can be passionate about a place with so much fucking sand is beyond me. I already want to get back on the road. Unfortunately, I've turned my back on a lot of things, but, but I couldn't seem to do it with my friend Paul. Not while he's deployed and unable to fix the mess for his girlfriend in person. Paul once refused to rat on me while I shattered a stained glass church window with a line drive. I'm here because I owe him and we grew up together in Boston, but then I'm gone. Until then, my job is to find Oscar Stanley's real killer. This happens a lot of time in my work of bounty hunting. My family is in denial. Their son violated his parole, but he's trying to turn his life around. Their daughter is on the lam, but only because she's innocent of the drug charge and no one believes her. I've heard it all before, and it goes in one ear and out the other. My job is to bring bad people to law enforcement's door and walk away whistling with a check without having to deal with any of the red tape or paperwork. This case is slightly different in that there is no bounty to collect. There is no criminal at charge. I don't have a name or a face of a person record at my disposal. All I have is a big question mark and a favour to return. However, after Paul gave me the rundown on Oscar Stanley and how his peeping Tom Vase got his not beat out of him prior to his murder, I'm inclined to agree with local PD on this one. The father of that girl came back to finish the job. It should take me one or two days to prove that beyond a shadow of doubt 
and get back on the highway, my slate wiped clean of any favours or responsibilities to anyone. On my way here to Coriander Lane, I have stopped at Lisa Stanley's house and picked up the set of keys I'm holding. Technically, this is a crime scene and there is no yellow caution tape outside the entrance, but obeying rules isn't really my strong suit. Never has been. That's why I was a shit detective and even worse husband. Might have been faithful, but loyalty only goes so far when man leaves out the cherishing part of his vows. Laughter kicks up down at the beach, voices intermingled with the sound of Tom Petty. A bumblebee kite dips and whirls in the sky. The smell of hot dogs and burgers carries in thick on the breeze. This is where people come on vacations with their family, to be happy. I can't wait to get the fuck out of here. I toss up the keys and catch them in my hand. Continuing across the street to the house where the murder supposedly occurred. I haven't seen crime scene photos, but I have the victim's description. And unlikely that a man of Oscar's statue would have been transported by the perpetrator post-mortem. Furthermore, why would the murderer make it easier for the body to be found? No, this was a crime of passion, anger, cut and dried. Get this over with. I'm halfway across the street when I sense eyes on my back. Slowly, I peer back over my shoulder and find a young woman, brownish blonde hair, maybe in her mid-twenties, watering a flower pot on the front porch of her house. She's completely missing the pot though. Water is pouring from the spout straight down onto the floorboards, splashing up onto her bare calves. She doesn't seem to notice her at all. Can I help you? I bark in a hard tone. She drops the can with a louder clatter, spins on her toe and runs head into the front door, bouncing right off the damn thing. Even from a hundred yards away, I can see the cannery spinning around her head. That's what you get for being nosy. I dig another antacid out of my jeans pocket and continue on my oh-so-merry way across the street, ripping the cautious tape off the front door and letting it flutter to the ground. I'm halfway over the threshold when I hear footsteps approaching from behind. Nimble, girly ones. In the reflection of the storm door, the nosy neighbor approaches. And boom, I'm already annoyed. Listen, you want to call the cops? Scowling, I turn around partially to face her. Be my... It's extremely weird. The way I just sort of forget what I'm saying. This has never happened to me before. Every word out of my mouth has a purpose and whoever I'm talking to better damn well listen. I just don't really know why I was planning on being so mean to her at all. Didn't she just run into a door? That had to hurt. Plus, there are water splatters all over her legs and she is... Facts are facts. She is cute as a button. I don't look twice at cute women. Anything cute, really. It would be like a tractor admiring a dandelion. Looking might seem like a fine idea, but tractors are built to mow down dandelions. It's what they do. So there isn't very much use in me noticing the way freckles just kind of scatter all the way from her nose down her neck to her tits, which are tied up in a bikini top, a pink one. The color alone makes me feel guilty for looking, but hell, they'd fit right into my hands. A lot of her would. Those hips. Her knees, the size of her beautiful face. Christ, the top of her head barely reaches my chin. What the hell is the matter with me? I clear my throat hard. As I was saying, you want to call the cops half pent? Be my guest. They know I'm here. Half pent? She gasps, sputters, pushes a big hunk of hair behind her ear, so I'm impacted by a full force of her eyes. Green ones. Fuck. I'll have you know, she continues, that I'm the tallest one at my job. You either work alone or you're a kindergarten teacher. A split second's hesitation. Subtle shift from right to left. Wrong. I wink at her eyes and she bristles. I'm never wrong. Is that a flush creeping up her neck? God, she has to be eight or nine years younger than me. Mid-twenties to my mid-thirties. So I'm definitely not noticing the spot where her bikini straps digs into her shoulder ever so lightly. Just the side is too tight. I'm definitely not thinking of tucking my fingers beneath it and dragging the little strip of material down her arm, unwrapping her like a birthday present. Jesus, I need to get laid. The fact wasn't obvious until right now, when I'm lusting after the stranger in the heart of middle-class vocation village, wondering what her nipples would look like in the sunshine, all legged up in my spit. She's probably married. Single girls in their 20s don't vocation in Cape Cod. Province town, maybe, but not this family-oriented section of Falmouth. So why isn't she wearing a ring? She notices me looking for one. Damn it. In response, her posture changes. Her hands drop to her side and she shifts left to right, unconsciously tossing her hair back over her shoulders. 
kind of like she's only now this very second becoming aware that i'm a man and she's approached me in a bikini and ridiculously cut off jean shorts that cover only slightly more than a pair of panties and that i'm interested enough to wonder if she's already got a man waiting for her in that sasha ryan sweet house with heart shape cut into shutters she's figuring all of that out and hiding none of it on her spectacular face great we've gone from beautiful to spectacular she is definitely married you idiot do your job and get gone go water your flowers i'm busy i know i was just her hands flutter around until she folds them at her waist well i was just wondering if you had any theories yet i just got here i tipped my chin at the bike you saw me arrive right on your death trap yes but i assume you've gotten some kind of advance dossier or case file right I give her a narrow eyed stare hoping she'll cower and slink away like everyone else who is unlucky enough to be on the receiving end of this look fine be coy about it mr don't worry about my name that throws her off for a second almost like she is disappointed but finally she shrugs i just thought you might like to speak with me with a prime little once over she turns and heads back across the street since i'm the one who found the body and all come back here i don't think i will half bent I have a name. Come back here and tell it to me then. What in God's name is wrong with me? Am I really following this young woman who is definitely married probably to someone named Carter or Preston across the street? I should be in the murder house taking pictures, checking for blood spatter or missed evidence. I should not be suddenly desperate to know this woman's name. But hell, if I can stop following in her wake when her ass moves like an ass ought to move. Damn. She spins on a dime and I almost mow her down just like a tractor always does with a dandelion. We end up toe to toe only I'm a good 10 inches taller so her face is tipped up to the sky and blanketed by sunshine. Something flips up my chest. Something I don't really like. You found the body. I say trying my best to stick to the job. That's what it is. Get in and get out. No entanglements. That's what I do. It's what I like. Her gaze drops to my mouth for a split second, but it's enough to make my bruise feel like an XL instead of an XXL. Uh-huh. Why does my skin turn clammy thinking of her around a dead man, a recently murdered one? She shouldn't have to see something like that. Not this woman who waters flowers and runs into doors. Tell me you got out of the house immediately in case the murderer was still on the property. Oh, she scrunched up her nose. No. We did not. We. There it is. I grunt because it's not a good idea to speak with my head burn acting up. That's what's wrong with me. That's why everything south of my neck is off kilter. You and your husband, me and my brother. Where did my heart burn go? It must be coming in waves. Your hair with your brother, I confirm, wincing over the thread of relief in my tone. She nods, I is serious. Who discovered the body is very important information. It probably should have been in the dozier. Now I have the damnedest urge to smile. Obviously I need my head examined. We don't call it a dozier, half bent. Curious head tilt. What do you call it? Notes. Boring old notes. And that's what this case is going to be. Boring, fast, open and shut. Dude was spying on a bunch of girls and got caught. Dad lost his temper. Physical altercations end in death a lot more often than you'd think. Either someone loses the fight and wants payback or one of them can't let it go. That's what happened here. But you were hired by Lisa Stanley, Oscar's sister? Technically yes, though I'm doing her boyfriend a favor. Did you speak to her? Didn't she tell you about the issue with the people theory? My head falls back on a gusty sigh. You're one of those amateur sleuths, aren't you? You've watched a couple of sensationalized documentaries on Netflix and now you think you're an honorary member of law enforcement. Podcasts are my thing actually. I send a groan towards the clouds. But that's not relevant. I've always liked to leave things neat and tidy. For instance, there's a loose thread on your shirt and I'm dying to trim it off. She wiggles her fingers at it and I come very close to stepping forward to give her access to the thread just to get her touching me. There is no reason for two peepholes if filming the guest was the goal. Only one would be necessary. Someone had to have spied with their two eyes at one time and Oscar Stanley could have never fit in that crawl space. Maybe he drilled the holes first, then he realized he miscalculated his ability to fit. Chewing on her lip, she says nothing. There isn't always a rhyme or a reason to a person's behavior, and a lot of time people just make mistakes, sort of like me taking this job. 
I make a shooting motion with my hand. Seriously, I need her to go back to her cookie cutter, vacation, house across the street because she's fucking with my peace of mind. I'm starting to notice things about her. A little mole beneath her navel. The way she sucks in her breath before she starts speaking. Her apple orchard scent. Run on home. I've got this covered. Like I said, I'm going to wrap this up quickly. After a moment, she nods and begins to back away. And it's like she's pulling my stomach along with her. Odd sense of loss. Doesn't make any sense. Ignore it. Okay, she mutters, adjusting her bikini strap. Well, when you need the guest book, I have it in my luggage. Uh Uh-huh, I say. I'm half turned when I realize what she said. Wait a second. You took the guest book from the house? She keeps walking, that sexy butt ticking side to side. Let me know if you need it. You can't just take evidence from a crime scene. What was that? She cups her hand around her ear. Sorry, I can't hear you over the ripping of caution tape. Don't be a smartass, I growl. I'm a professional. Stopping at the bottom of her porch stairs, she cocks her hip. Neither one of us is qualified to collect evidence because we are not police officers. Lisa said that you are a bounty hunter, correct? I'm a second grade teacher. A second grade teacher. I was mostly right. That's why she's the tallest at her job. She must know what I'm thinking because she gives me a grudging smile. Before I can stop myself, I smile back. I smile back. It drops faster than a bowling ball. Give me the guest book, half bent. She's jogging up the stairs now, like she doesn't give a care in the world. Only if you keep me informed of any developments. She calls over her shoulder. Time to face facts. I'm a big, nasty motherfucker. And this freckle-faced teacher couldn't be less scared of me if she tried. Not a chance in hell. I shout back. She gives me a pinky wave and shuts the door. The absence of her is like a cloud passing over the sun and the fact that I notice her being gone so profoundly does not sit well. I've known her for 10 minutes. She's deliberately withholding something that might make my job easier. And most importantly, she's not my type. She's not even in the stratosphere of my type. Every once in a while, I take home an age-appropriate woman, usually a divorce like me, who shares my disdain for romance, true love, happily ever after. Disney tells that shit to females from age zero and men have to cope up with those expectations our entire life. No, not me. One look at a woman and it's easy to see her expectations are on the fucking moon. Drink her flowers. Not enough. I'd probably have to plant her a garden and waltz in it with her head beneath the stars. She's the marrying type. I can guarantee that based on the fact that she's vocationing in Cape Cod and not on the Jersey Shore or Miami. She's not a one-night role in the hay and that's what I like. I'm not interested in anything else. Doing my best to put the green-eyed menace out of my mind, I kick open the door to the house and stomp inside. The scent of decay lingers in the air, but not strong enough to require a face covering. Nice place. Not the kind of rental that would put a person on guard against peepholes or hidden cameras. First, I head to the laundry room. Camera app at the ready. Blood spatter all over the walls indicates the victim was shot in this location, as does the black pool of the bodily substances on the ground. Perp would have liked entered through the back door of the house, so I got there next. Lock is intact, not broken, but that doesn't mean anything. It could have been unlocked at the time of the murder. No breaking or entering required. I make my way upstairs to the master bedroom, and irritatingly, I find myself wondering if I'm looking at the bed where she planned to sleep. Damn thing would have swallowed her up. Now, if I was sleeping in it with her, a pulse travels through my dick at the thought of it. Us in bed together. She'd have to ride me though. I couldn't just get on top and go for broke. Not with our different sizes. I'm not gentle in bed and she'd... She'd need that. Tenderness, wouldn't she? She's sure as shit not getting it from you, I mutter, scrubbing at the back of my neck, unable to find the itch that's plaguing me. I'm probably just unsettled because there's a piece of evidence I should have at my disposal and someone has stolen it. Right out from under the noses of cops too. Huh. She might come across innocent, but she's got a rebellious streak, doesn't she? Don't think about that. Don't think about what the streak might lead her to do. Like hook up with a rough, unmannered bounty hunter while on vacation. Not my type, I rasp, raising my camera to get a shot of the peepholes. I stop. I tilt my gym and lean closer. The wood grain on the edges of both holes points outward toward the bedroom. The holes were drilled from inside the crawl space. God damn it. Oscar Stanley was a big man. It would have taken severe maneuvering to drill those holes without physically being inside the crawl space. And yeah, fine. Why would he need two holes unless he planned on looking through them? I'm nowhere near abandoning the cut and derive theory that Oscar Stanley is a peeping Tom who spied on his guests, but the wooden grain is throwing me off a little. 
despite wanting to wrap up this job as quickly as possible i'm not and will never be the type to leave questions unanswered or close a case with the finger pointed at the wrong suspect all in the name of expediency according to paul the cops already spoke to the father jud forester he denies shooting and killing oscar stanley only admits to fist fight days before but i need to speak with him myself or determine whether or not he's telling the truth beyond that who else had or has access to the place i don't know do i i grit out striding down the staircase because i don't have the goddamn guest book when i open the front door of the house she's watching me from the front window of her house left caught between her teeth she starts to duck out of sight but i shake my head crooking my finger at her now it's her turn to shake her head i keep going until i've climbed the porch and knocked on the door are you going to keep me informed she calls through the door no i'd really just like to be kept in the loop no please i'm about to state my intentions to kick the door off the hinges but my mouth snaps shut on the word please i don't know why it's just a word but coming from her it makes me sweat who says no to this woman especially when she asks in that hopeful princess voice me continuing to say no is disappointing her i can hear her growling less and less optimistic and that doesn't sit right in fact disappointing her is like a broken glass digging into my stomach lining am i going to say yes just to make her happy hell i don't know but i find myself very unwilling to do the opposite why i say crossing my arms why is this so important to you a thick passes and then the door opens slowly There's her face appearing in the opening and I won't acknowledge how my rib cage seems to shrink wrap around my heart throwing off the steady beat damn she's a beautiful woman soft the kind of woman who makes a man want to be a hero other men not me obviously she looks back over her shoulder to see if her brother is around when she faces me again she speaks in a reluctant whisper forcing me to lean forward forcing me to count the flecks of gold in her green eyes i'm not very brave she says quietly I'm really sensible and I always play it safe but I saw a dead body and didn't vanish into dust I stayed calm and I called the police I found blankets for me and Jude gave a detailed statement to detective Wright I haven't thought a lot about how I would react in a terrible situation like that but I thought I would cry or hyperventilate or die of fright definitely thought I would pack up and run home but I didn't I surprised myself by sticking it out and I guess I just want to see what else I can do she blinks up at me the dark fringe of her lashes seeming to sweep down and up in a slow motion does that make sense bounty hunter she still doesn't know my name keep it that way because i'm about to ask if she perhaps need a blanket now too so if she said my name i would be fucking toast somehow i know that like i know my way around a harley because i'm not going to lie her explanation seems to have opened a trap door in my belly and all of my irritation is failing right through it gone i'm mostly wondering who the hell told her she wasn't brave That would be a satisfying person to kill. You aren't backing down from my scary ass, are you? I cough into her fist, glancing off down the block. Seems pretty brave to me. When I look back at her, she's smiling at me. Not a grudging one, a big, unrestrained one that punches me square in the jaw. Uh, you're not scary at all. She informs me brightly. Yes, I am. I shout back because it feels totally necessary. Like I'm acting out of self-preservation here. Am I? What has happened to me in the last 30 minutes? Taylor, who are you talking to? Following the newcomer's muffled question, footsteps approach behind her and a man appears, grinding a knuckle into his eye socket and yawning. When he opens his eyes and spots me in the door, he jolts backwards with a startled curse. Jesus fucking Christ. See? I tell her. Caught between satisfaction and embarrassment, an emotion I am unfamiliar with. It has never existed for me until now apparently. when this woman is about to realize i'm the beast and she is beauty but she just goes on smiling do you want to come inside and look at the guest book she pushes the door wider i just made lemonade i'm giving up too much ground here so i say very pointedly do i look like i drink lemonade i step inside the house and they both back up the brother jude i believe she said edging towards his sister protectively i'll take a beer okay says tella nudging her brother in the ribs he's going to help us solve the murder case i didn't say that but she's already skipping off towards the kitchen what in the god's name have i gotten myself into chapter 4 taylor i hand the bounty hunter his bottle of beer and he grimaces at the label sorry i take the chair across from him in the living room it's all we have peach flavored beer he turns it over and reads the nutrition facts as if he suspects we're playing a practical joke on him for once since the hunter arrived 
he's not inspecting me very closely so i use the opportunity to return the scrutiny based on the appearances alone this man might have just walked out of a criminal underworld if the permanent scowl on his face didn't scream villain then the long unkempt hair and poorly scalded tattoos do the trick as do the scars on his knuckles and the side of his neck and then there is his attire filthy boots covered with suspicious substances jeans and black t-shirt in dire need of washing of burning and worn brown leather cuffs on his wrists sitting on the fluffy white couch and frowning down at the peach flavored beer this giant at least 6 foot 5 man looks comically out of place he belongs in the back room of a roadside play of a roadside bar playing pool and inciting violence and causing general mayhem he's been plucked from that sketchy scenario and dropped into yet another nautical themed living room surrounded by tasteful reminders of the ocean and throw pillow covers in little ship wheels for all intents and purposes he should be terrifying he might be if it weren't for a few little clues that he is in fact the opposite of scary in regards to me anyway i'm sure everyone else's terror is warranted when i informed the bounty hunter that i'd discovered the body he turned white as a ghost looked like he was prepared to toss his cookies right there in the street for that fleeting handful of seconds his scowl dropped and he shifted straight into perspective tell me you got out of the house immediately in case the murderer was still on the property he was worried about me how unexpectedly heartwarming and i would be remiss if i didn't take into account his smile upon finding out he was correct and i am in fact a teacher we shared a smile across the street and i'm still feeling kind of jumbled over it when this man smiles he's actually quite handsome his teeth though white and straight look like they could jump straight through a leather belt or crush a rock but yes when he smiles he's undeniably attractive his own brand of attractive not the classic kind not like the men i usually go on dates with tidy businessman with neat fingernails and upward mobility in the line of work they're searching for the right partner with whom they purchase a starter home and eventually have children it's all outlined in our dating profiles serious prospects only i wonder if the bounty hunter has an online dating presence he'd probably be flashing the middle finger in his profile picture all the right women would match with him adventurous souls who desire to tear down the highway on the back of his motorcycle and who knows eat fresh clams at some hideaway that only local baddies know about or something my last date was at cheesecake factory i don't know i'm frowning at the bounty hunter until he raises an eyebrow at me have you been to the cheesecake factory i asked him the what i knew it i forced myself to a pleasant frame of mind gesturing for jude to sit down he still caught halfway between the kitchen and the living room as if undecided about whether or not to call the police well would you like to share your first impression of the crime scene he sets down the peach beer on the distressed white coffee table sliding the offering drink away with the tip of his finger no half pint i would not he clears his throat anyway you two are technically both suspects until i rule you out wouldn't exactly be wise to give you the pertinent details suspects i sputter incredulous but we have alibis we weren't even in cape cod yet when the murder took place how can you have alibis when the time of death hasn't been determined my mouth snaps shut i need to start paying closer attention to etched in bone working on my lessons plan at the same time has clearly led to some important lessons being missed i suppose i made an assumption based on the smell of decomposition guess we'll see barnstable pd is putting toll bridge footage to make sure you didn't get here sooner The bounty hunter rolls a shoulder. Where is the guest book? Now that he has struck me by calling me suspect, I feel a strong urge to return the favor, to surprise him. Let him know he's not just dealing with a bumbling podcast junkie. I'm a pandemic era teacher, damn it. That basically qualifies me for a presidential run. A little caught off guard by this new glimmer of self-confidence, I sit up straight. Did you happen to notice the wood grain of peoples? His head comes up fast. Ha. Huh. So he did notice. And while his gaze is drilling into me, curious and irritable, I notice his eye color is a lovely mixture of brown and mossy. Why do I find that combination so pleasing and hard to look away from? You've been back over there since that night you discovered the body, haven't you? Of course she hasn't. It's surrounded by caution tape. Jude points out Medion. Yes, and I replaced it exactly as I found it. I explain, hoping my cheerful tone will make it sound altogether less illegal. That's more than I can say for some people. Jude leans her shoulder against the wall, expression dazed. You really went back over there without telling me? Alone? He studies me closely, half impressed, half horrified. That's not like you, T. Suddenly I'm jumpy. I know. Now they're both looking at me like a bug under a microscope. My brother is totally right. This is not like me. 
Do I love a riddle? A mystery? Yes. I love wrapping up debates or discussions with a resolution. No open ends. But those qualities are usually applied to a game of Clue. I'm not the type of person to break into a crime scene. What I told the bounty hunter is true though. I surprised myself when I discovered Oscar Stanley's body. A foreign sort of calm permeated my blood, settling the flow and I started operating on the high wire of adrenaline. I'm extra awake, noticing every detail. I don't want to lose that feeling. I want to keep exploring the boost of confidence it gave me to be so hardy. Maybe this will be short-lived. Maybe I'm just play-acting as a brave person. But I would like to know one way or the other. Sorry, Jude. I'll tell you next time. My brother stares without blinking, amusement making his eyes twinkle. Next time? There isn't going to be a next time, states old gravel voice party pooper, aka the bounty hunter. Give me what I need so I can leave. I ignore him, still speaking to my brother, because we weren't finished. I promise not to let this interfere with your vacation. I want you to go home relaxed. We both need to relax, all right? Jude says softly, not just me. I know, it's just it. Yeah, I know. Silence lands in the room. The bounty hunter treats both of us with a frown. Are you two talking in fucking code or something? Jude chuckles. That's probably what it sounds like. He pushes off the wall and moves into the living room, dropping down onto the opposite end of the couch from the hunter, ankle thrown over knee. My sister used a big chunk of her savings, despite my protests, I might add, on this vacation because I lost someone close to me. That surly man sort of chugs through an apology. Sorry. That word appears to taste like old bath water in his mouth. It's fine. It was time. Jude sighs, looking down at his hands. Bartholomew made it all the way to 22. The bounty hunter's frown deepens. 22? Bart was a panda. I'm a panda caretaker. You're more than that, I say, trying and failing to keep the pride out of my voice because I don't want to embarrass him. I'm the queen of embarrassing my brother. When they called his name in the college graduation, I leapt onto my chair and screeched louder than anyone. I was sobbing so hard, I knocked over a tuba player and twisted an ankle trying to get down. Never stand on a cheap plastic chair in high heels. Displaced or abandoned pandas are brought to the animal sanctuary where Jude works. Some of them are so young, they haven't even learned to survive on their own yet. So Jude dresses like a panda and teaches them. You dress like a panda? Yes, teach them how to forage, eat and climb. Socialize with other pandas. Jude winks at the man on the other side of the couch. The suit looks great on me. Bartholomew was sort of the unofficial forest dad, wasn't he? I dab at the moisture in my eyes. He was sort of disagreeable, like you, bounty hunter. But once Jude taught the new babies the ropes, he started to warm up to them. Hate to break it to you, but none of the heartwarming shit is going to happen here. Our guest appears to be contemplating the peach-flavored beer out of pure desperation. I'm a bounty hunter, and you are some of the weirdest people I've ever met. He's silent a beat, then looks at Jude. Do you actually eat the leaves? Jude grins. I don't swallow. The bounty hunter does a double take at that, then abruptly points at me. Guess what? Now. Okay, okay, it's upstairs. No one has ever risen from a chair more slowly in their life. I'll just go grab it now. But while I'm still here in the living room, one step towards the staircase, pause. You don't seem quite as sold on the original trucker dad theory anymore. I'm just performing my due diligence. He scratches his upper arm absently, giving me a more complete look at his tattoos. Wow. That skeleton has fireball for eyes. The working theory stands though. As far as we know, no one else has a motive to murder Oscar Stanley. See? That's what I thought. But then we lived on the street for two days. Jude drawled, and we met some of the permanent residents. You might say one of them stood out. I wiggle my fingers in my brother's direction. Show him, Jude. I don't want to be shown anything, grips the bounty hunter. I shush him. He gapes at me. Jude's finger moves across the screen of his phone, locating the music streaming app. He hits play on the first song on his list, and bleachers begin to drip through the Bluetooth speaker situated on the fireplace mantel. After a nod from me, he cranks the volume and right on cue, there is a loud crash sound, a door slamming, and then the side of a rental house being bashed by the handle of a broom. That would be Sal. I inform the hunter, our neighbor. He also does this when our tea kettle whistles and when I... Great, I'm blushing. When I sing in the shower. Do I detect a slight lip twitch from the big tattooed meanie? That burgeoning smile disappears when Sal begins his tirade. Keep it down in there. I can hear your music through my walls. This is supposed to be a quiet community and you fucking renters are ruining it. I'm sick of this shit. That's when he really starts to wail on the house. I'd like to kill the bastard who allow this. What about my right to peace on my own property, damn it? Jude turns off the music, tosses the phone up in the air, 
catches and holsters it in his pocket like a wild west gunslinger. You should hear Sal when Taylor sings anything by Kelly Clarkson. Something about since you've been gone just triggers him, I add with a shiver. Then again, it might just be my singing. I sound like a choking cat. No, you don't. Jude argues. You're amazing. My eyes are moist again. Thank you. The bouncy hunter drops his head back and sighs at the ceiling. Jesus Christ. I take one more slow step towards the staircase. Aren't you going to say anything about Sal? I've made a mental note. He responds to his teeth. He looks like he's about to say more, but apparently Sal isn't finished. From the outside of the kitchen window, our temporary neighbor yells, Tell that bitch to close the window when she stinks before she breaks every mirror in my house. I've never seen anyone move so fast in my life. One second, the bounty hunter is there. A dangerous glint occupies his eyes, so dangerous that it actually makes me shudder. And then he's on his feet, storming out of the house and down the front porch. Sal makes a muffled exclamation followed by something low and unintelligible from the bounty hunter. Jude and I stare at each other, jaw in our laps. What is he doing? whispers my brother. Who is this guy? I don't have a chance to answer because our guest is stomping back into the house, slamming the door behind him loud enough to rattle the hinges. Guest book. Now. I run for the stairs and take them two at a time. On the top one, I stumble a little. When I glance down the steps to determine whether or not someone saw me, I give a close mouth scream. The bouncy hunter is right behind me and I didn't even hear him move. Glovering, he wraps his gorilla-sized hands around my waist and lifts me back on my feet. Move. Okay, I whimper. He follows me down the hallway into the master bedroom. My heart is bouncing back and forth between my eardrums and my jeweler. My bikini top and cut-off shorts were appropriate downstairs as we were mere steps from the beach and at a escape cot. But now, in this plush, inviting, nautical-themed, of course, bedroom, I'm suddenly feeling very undressed and exposed, goosebumps launching to attention on every inch of my skin. In my self-consciousness, I get defensive. You don't have to shadow me. I kneel in front of my suitcase and frown at him over my shoulder. I'm getting the book. From my position on the floor, he towers over me like a skyscraper. You were stalling. I shuffle aside the Sudoku piece I brought in search of the guest book. It would be much easier if I opened the suitcase, but my fancy panties are in the mesh side of the pocket and I think if the man saw them, I would die. What did he say to Sal? Don't worry about it. Uh, Taylor, are you okay up there? Jude calls from downstairs. I'm coming up. No, it's fine. I call back. Do I have a sort of weird, possibly misplaced confidence that this man won't hurt me? Is he a wild card where everyone else is concerned? Yes. The last thing I want is Jude putting himself in jeopardy. We're just talking. I wet my lips, searching for a way to reassure my brother. Jude, coconuts. Be a little less obvious while giving a code word half bent mutters the bounty hunter, his knees hitting the ground beside me. Before I can stop him, he's thrown open up on the top of my suitcase, and there they are, my frilly red panties. Right there in the dead center of the case, impossible to miss. Don't panic. Maybe he'll do the polite thing and ignore them. What are those? He asks, jabbing them with a blunt finger. They are... you know what they are. He glances between my suitcase and the dresser. Why don't you unpack them like everything else? My face is a deeper shade of red than the panties now. I didn't know if I was going to need them. Understanding dawns. You bought them in case you meet someone. I stay staunchly silent. After some very brittle digging, I hand him the guest book. Only now he doesn't seem as interested in taking it and leaving. He's watching me from beneath those thickly drawn eyebrows. You have a pair of hookup panties? No, I don't. I blurt. I have to hook up in them at least once to call them that. Why? Why did I say that? Can I fast forward to the end of my life now? You date, right? He's not letting this drop. Mere moments ago, he was dying to get out of here. Now he looks like he's settling in for a conversation? You must date constantly. Why would you assume that? He rolls his eyes. Oh, we're gonna play games? Games? You're gonna pretend that you don't know you're beautiful to get a compliment out of me. Is that how this is going to go, half bent? His laughter is strained. It's not happening. I'm not going to point out that he just referred to me as beautiful. Meaning he already complimented me. That would be childish. I did, yes. But I wouldn't call it constantly, more like occasionally. Is there a slight sheen of sweat on his forehead that wasn't there a moment ago? And you've never gotten to use your hookup panties? Stop calling them that. I smack him hard in the shoulder and he doesn't even flinch. I'm not a virgin. I'm just, I'm picky. Unforgivably picky. It's why I'm going to end up alone.
He processes that with an unreadable expression. Let me guess. You want a man who wears a suit and Arjil fucking socks to work and reads the finance section of the newspaper at breakfast while mumbling, yes dear, no dear, like a robot. That's a pretty bold assumption. His upper lip's curl. Am I wrong? It's a challenge in his eyes that pushes me past polite into uncharted territory. Maybe discovering poor dead Oscar brought me into this place too. A place of clarity. I'm not sure. But as I kneel on the floor beside his bee moth, I hear echoes in the back of my mind. People throughout my life, college friends, colleagues, and especially my parents, telling me I'm sensible, that I always play it safe. Even my second graders like to point out my idiosyncrasies. Giggling over the way, I check the temperature of my coffee with a pinky before sipping, even after five or six gulps, just to be sure. Sending out search parties for kids who take longer than five minutes in the bathroom like a nervous Nelly. And I'm not claiming that my recent proximity to murder has transformed me into the new Lara Croft or anything, but I've felt bolder and more in charge in the last two days than I've ever felt before. This bully isn't going to knock me back a step. Besides, I haven't always wanted to play it safe, not in every aspect of my life. I've always had a little or maybe not so little desire for some added zest. I guess I wouldn't mind the suit and the socks and the finance section of man. Not, no, that would be fine with me. As long as he doesn't treat me like porcelain in bed. Lord, it is incredibly satisfying to witness the smirk fade from his face. Take that, muscle head. That's where the pickiness comes in. It seems I can't have both. On one hand, I'd like a man who makes a good living and wants a family someday. On the other, I'd like to be manhandled more than once in a while. Just sort of thrown down and told who is boss, you know? Is that too much to ask? But on the three occasions I've dated a man long enough to to do it, they insisted on treating me with respect in bed. It was incredibly disappointing. Zero stars. Wouldn't recommend. That sheen of sweat is a lot more obvious now, along with his utter shock. I like the bold new me. I just rendered a bounty hunter speechless. And I still have four days left on this vacation. There. I pat his massive shoulder. You have your book. Time to go. Book? He rasps. The guest book? This is the best day of my life. The one you're holding? Right. You might be interested to know that prior to the group of girls who stayed there last week, no one had rented the house since last summer. Using the edges of the bed for balance, I climb on my feet. Because Oscar himself had been living there for full ten months. That's so. The bounty hunter murmurs. He's staring at my belly button like it's the one speaking. I could pretend I don't like his attention on me, but I think that ship is leaving port at full speed. I found him attractive before, despite his wildly rude personality. Now, in the setting of my bedroom, having given him very personal details about my sexual longings, intimacy builds between us. Potent. Whiskerel. And I can't help it. There's no way to stop my body from responding to him, because this man is definitely not the one I'm searching for to settle down with. But I'd bet he'd give me the elusive physical treatment I can't seem to track down for the life of me. Or at least come close. I'm starting to think animal attraction, paired with actual love and respect, only exist in scripted movies and romance novels. His gaze travels down and lingers on the zipper of my shorts, inching lower to the apex of my thighs. He wets his lips. The air in my lung evaporates. Oh god, what's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing can happen, right? It's daytime and my brother is downstairs. Apparently I'm the one making a mental pro con list because the bounty hunter reaches out and grips the waistband of my shorts, the heat of his touch searing my hips and he drags me forward, fast enough to make me stumble a little. His hot breath curls in my belly button and I reach for his hair, tangling it around my fingers, exhilaration pouring through me like a mile high waterfall. And then he licks me. He licks across my exposed belly from one hip to another, then bites down on my abductor, hard enough to make me gasp. I'm Miles. He says hoarsely. That's my name. Miles. I whisper, my knees seconds from giving out. Taylor? Calls Jude from downstairs, beginning to sound alarmed. You good up there? Coconuts? I try to say, but it comes out sounding like gibberish. And that gives Bounty Hunter pause. With a rocky sigh, he rises to his full height and looks down at me through narrowed eyes. He takes my chin in his hand and tilts it up, scrutinizing every inch of my face. You might feel unsatisfied after being treated with kid gloves, but... At least there was affection there. I don't have any of that in me. None. Trust me. You'd feel a lot worse after us sleeping together. Being respected is much better than empty sex. That's what I'd give you. Maybe that's what I want. His pupils dilate a touch more and he steps closer, eyelids drifting down. His fingernails sliding into my hair and gently fisting my hair. And goddamn, I'd like to provide it. That mattress would never be the same if you put on those red panties for me. But it's the worst idea I've had in years, and believe me, half-print, that's saying something.
With a visible effort, he drops his hand from my head and backs away, dragging a shaking hand down in his open mouth. Backs away, dragging a shaking hand down in his open mouth. Stay out of trouble, Taylor. I mean it. Does that mean he's not coming back? I nod absently, trying to hide my immense disappointment that he's no longer touching me. My body is hurt and exposed, and I'm twisted in knots in the most intimate place. And he's leaving. My brain tells me that there is no other choice. He's right. I can't just have a fling with a bounty hunter. I mean, one who looks like and acts like he just escaped hell, no less. Maybe I'm overestimating my ability to have a wild fling. Maybe I'm just on a high from this new courageous behavior, but I'm not actually built for meaningless sex. The neighbor won't bother you again. Sing Kelly Clarkson as loud as you want. He looks like he feels stupid for saying that, cursing under his breath and wheeling around a booted heel to leave the room. A moment later, the door slams downstairs. Without thinking, I cross the window and look down, watching Miles climb onto his bike, a Harley Davidson, I notice now, and strap a helmet on. He looks up at me and kicks the engine to life. And God help me, I have to cross my legs to ensure the clench of my sex is so intense and prolonged. Finally, he breaks eye contact and roars off down the street. I drop down on the bed and stare blankly into space, willing my libido to shrink back down to usual, reasonable level. Something is off in the room, but I don't quite realize what it is for several moments. Not until Jude walks in to check on me and I automatically reach for the suitcase lid to close it so I don't have to explain my frivolous purchase twice in a day. And that's when I realize the red panties are gone. Miles' business card sits in their place.